Today, or right now, we are going to talk about seagrass or seagrass meadows. Now the first thing you might want to know is what is a seagrass meadow? And what I think you could enjoy is a terrestrial analogy. Now seagrass meadows are vast grassy habitats of the coastal zone and they're kind of equivalent to, say, the grasslands of Africa or the prairies of North America and they are grazed by large mammalian herbivores. So this is the similarity I want you to hold in mind as we go through this lecture. So, but what actually are seagrasses? Now seagrasses are not algae. And in this lecture, sometimes I call algae, algae, sometimes seaweeds and sometimes macroalgae, but seagrass definitely don't fall into those categories. They're actually higher plants, so flowering plants, that live submerged in seawater. And this picture here I have is to remind you of that. This is of the flower of the large seagrass and harlas from Singapore. And it's provided by Ria Tan, who, who maintains a beautiful website called Wild Singapore, if you'd like to go there and have a look at other images of seagrasses. Where do they live? Seagrasses occur basically below the mangroves in tropical habitats. They occur from about the mean tide level, so where the water is half of the time, essentially, to the subtidal, so where they're submerged all the time. Now, unlike mangroves that are woody angiosperms or woody higher plants, seagrasses are herbaceous, and that's what makes them easy to digest by these large grazing, grazers that occur in seagrass beds dugongs, manatees, and also turtles. Now globally, they're distributed all over the planet in shallow water, except for the poles. So you won't see seagrasses in the North and South Pole, but you do see them in temperate environments. And you can see here, the light colors indicate a low seagrass diversity, which means fewer species occurring in the temperate regions compared to the tropics. And in the tropics, we have the highest number of species and most of them are associated, or most of them occur, right on the same place of the planet that corals and mangroves are also at their highest diversity. And that is over the coral triangle associated with Indonesia, Papua New Guinea and Northern Australia. Within those shallow coastal habitats, they, are, they occur mostly in the soft sediments. And by that, I mean muds, silts, sands. These are plants with roots and they need something soft in which to grow. So they require shallow and also low wave energy habitats. And that's because high wave energy will rip up those plants and rip them out of the sediment. So where are seagrasses distributed at a smaller scale within uh, the tropic, if you went out and you went to the coast, where actually they, are they going to occur? And they occur in estuaries, in coastal habitats, and in deep water, and also associated with coral reefs. So they're in habitats where light is high enough to support photosynthetic carbon gain. So that's the process where carbon dioxide is absorbed into the plants and used to make carbohydrates and other molecules that are needed for growth. So you can see if you look at this image that light is sometimes low when you're in estuaries and you're associated with rivers and there's outwelling of sediments and other material. So in those places, then seagrass tend to occur in very shallow habitats and even in the intertidal where they're exposed to air some of the time. But where you move into very, very clear water, you can have seagrass occurring at quite deep depths uh, in the ocean. So this is a little bit of a summary here that tells you what we've just been through and what's really important. And the first thing is that seagrass require high light levels for photosynthesis and growth. And that's important for later on when we go to the other parts of this lecture. They can't withstand high wave energy. So storms and really high wave energy coasts are not the place where you find them. In those places, you might find macroalgae, for example, kelps. 
they're restricted because of those two physical constraints. They're restricted to shallow water and relatively calm environments. The other key factor here is that increasing the turbidity of the water or the amount of sediment or chlorophyll in the water is going to tend to lead to a loss in seagrasses as they can't do photosynthesis that's required for growth.